Now I know it's not actually the end of 2023 yet. I've still got a couple of weeks, but I need to film this for Vlogmas. And I honestly think even if I screw up in these next couple of weeks, I have a pretty good idea of how the overall year went for my year long no buy. Hi everybody, I am coming to the end of 2023 and my first year long no buy and today I want to talk to you about six things that I learned this year about my spending habits, about spending in general, basically my takeaways from my no buy year. So for some context and I'll leave the playlist down below if you want to watch the previous check-ins, the original video, etc. For the last year, 2023, I have been on a no buy in three categories, planner and stationery, beauty, skincare, and food delivery. Each category went kind of differently from each other and my takeaways maybe applied more to one category more than another, but overall I find it to be a fairly successful year in terms of resetting my habits, in terms of being more thoughtful with the things that I'm purchasing. Although the one thing I really wanted to come out of it, which was using up more of my stuff, didn't apply to all of the categories evenly. Let's talk about my six takeaways from my no buy year. The first takeaway, retraining myself and how I shop in physical stores. I got a pretty good handle on that. Retraining myself with how I shop online. Still working on that. Whew. When it comes to physical stores, I actually had a pretty successful year in terms of retraining how I approach them. When it comes to more specialized stores like Ulta or Sephora or Michaels or the art supply store, generally speaking, I got pretty good at only going in there when I needed something specific and then zeroing in on that one thing that I needed and not browsing. I actually got very good at that. My kid even was with me a couple times when I went into Sephora and I was like, I need this thing. Got to get, it's usually deodorant. I go through that the fastest and I buy my deodorant from Sephora because I'm fucking bougie, apparently. Gotten very good at kind of targeting what I need and focusing on that. However, it was a little harder with the bigger, more generalized stores like Target, for example. Mostly Target. I actually don't really shop at Walmart and... I think Target is the main store that's like one of those places that has all the things. It took me a little while to get the hang of not being tempted. And the biggest way to do that was just to avoid entire sections. Like I just avoided the stationary section altogether unless I had something specific I needed to buy. And then I sort of zeroed in the same way I did with the other stores. Makeup and skincare was a little more difficult to get the hang of purely because I often had to go into that section even if it wasn't for me, for something for my kids. And it was a little harder to, when I was already in shopping mode to kind of avoid those things. But with practice, I really didn't have, I don't have a better tip for you there than to really focus on what you need. A list is fantastic, especially going into somewhere like Target, but also practicing it. Like every time you go into Target, walk past the section, but don't enter it. Like that was kind of what trained me to uh, do a little bit better. But over the course of the year with practice, I have gotten pretty good at that. I'm not really at a point right now where I don't trust myself in physical stores. Online shopping, on the other hand, it's a work in progress. I think it was easy to avoid the smaller shops that focus on specific things, kind of like with the physical stores, right? If you have a shop that only does stickers and I'm not buying stickers, I just don't go to that shop. It was the generalist websites that I struggled with so like Amazon, that sort of situation. If I had to go into Amazon, like I, I have to utilize Amazon for a couple of things because dialysis supplies, there's certain kinds of band-aids that it's like near impossible for me to get rapidly. Like I can't find them in stores and if I order from a specialty website, they take months. So I get them off of Amazon. There's other things like that, you know, a few things from around the house that I just can't get in my local stores. That was a little harder because I get recommended so many things and then I'm like, ooh, and I go down that rabbit hole, especially being on dialysis. That I think was why online shopping was so much harder for me, being stuck in a chair for four hours a day, five days a week, where you could only move one hand. I played a lot of online games and actually completely unrelated to the no buy. I, um, 
I may have spent some money on microtransactions. Not a ton. I didn't do things like, like certain middle schoolers who shall remain nameless in my household have done in the past. Jesse came up to me and was like, look, I don't mind if you spend a little bit of money on these games because they're like, you're the, the, what you keep you entertained while you're on dialysis, but like, gotta rein it in here a little bit, dude. And I was kind of embarrassed. So, uh, that's something I'm working on. But aside from that, like aside from sitting there trying to get some work done, trying to watch a movie, trying to play video games, shopping sometimes tends to be one of the things that kind of brings my, brings me into a Zen place when I'm on dialysis. And that's not something that I want to focus on. I need other Zen places than shopping, but it did make it harder, especially this year as I was adjusting to dialysis to avoid the online shopping. So overall, have I gotten better? Yes. Have I utilized wish lists more? Yes. Am I still recognizing that I am not, my habits have not been entirely reset when it comes to online shopping? Also, yes. One thing I did start doing and it's been helping, so here's a bonus tip for you, is if you are online shopping and you see something you really want, put it in the cart or put it in a wish list and then leave it alone. Set a time boundary for yourself. For me, it was usually a couple of weeks, maybe a month. But if I go back to it after that time and I still want it, I'll probably let it go. And if I don't want it, I'll definitely let it go. But it reduces the sting because I'm like no longer quite as frantic about it. And if I do really, really want it, maybe ask yourself why. Is it something you don't have? Is it something that could you could use in your life? But at least by giving yourself that time limit, you're not in the immediate dopamine joy of automatically buying something. That Which is why online shopping is so insidious to begin with. Going back to dialysis, that brings me to the second thing I learned. A full no buy on food delivery when you're doing home hemodialysis five days a week is not practical for my family. And if you've been watching my check-in videos, this should be no surprise to you. It got to the point, especially once we hit the summertime and onwards, even if we have food in the fridge and we've meal planned, there are just times, at least usually once every couple of weeks, where we either have to do dialysis at night or Jesse and I are both too burned out from work and dialysis and doctor's appointments and everything else to cook. And sometimes I'll just go out and get it, but sometimes, especially if I'm on dialysis, I can't leave the house, obviously. Jesse can't leave the house because he can't leave me alone. He can go outside or something if one of the kids is sitting with me, but he, they're not trained enough for him to leave the house, even for 10 minutes to pick something up. And neither kid drives yet. So there comes a point when food delivery is pretty necessary for us, or at the very least, maybe not necessary, but goes from just the want to have to kind of need to have in those situations. And I needed to be okay with that. When I started the year, I was like, no more food delivery, no DoorDash, no Grubhub, no Insta food, Uber, eat, whatever, no store delivery, none of that. Just we either go pick it up or we cook. And that's just the way it goes. And then as the year progressed, we started having to order it every once in a while in these situations. And I felt super guilty. And then finally, after talking to Jesse, after kind of thinking through it, I realized a no buy is not realistic for us, but having re greatly reduced the amount of delivery we were doing, the pandemic really put us into a like habit of food delivery and we were spending ridiculous amounts of money on it. It was, not a good scene for us. So I think we have still accomplished the goal of getting so much better. Like now we don't order it for lunch anymore at all. Maybe once in a while, Jesse will order it if he's having a really heinous day at work and he wants something nice for his lunch. But like I haven't ordered DoorDash for lunch in this year pretty, pretty much. I think maybe once or twice, but like it was happening all the time. Dinner as well. Like we're only doing it maybe once every two weeks. It just depends on how dialysis is going that week. But that's basically what it's reserved for now is two things. Either A, we are dialyzing late or dialysis is really taking it out of us, or B, Jess and I are going out for a date and there isn't enough food in the house for the kids to make themselves something, so we'll order them DoorDash as a special treat. But that's it. And I feel com I'm comfortable with that. I feel like we have hit a reasonable relationship with food delivery, but coming to that realization, it took the no buy to really help us understand its place in our lives and in our budget. The third thing that I learned was that no buying in certain categories may have helped reset my habits in those categories, but it didn't really help my shopping habits in other categories. I thought at the beginning of the year that maybe one of two things was going to happen. Either 
I was going to get really good at this whole no buy thing and it was going to sort of apply across the board, or I was going to shop hella hardcore in other categories to make up for the dopamine I was missing from my planner and beauty no buys specifically. Neither of those happened. I don't think I really went hardcore in any category and I know I didn't get better at shopping in any category. I think I kind of stayed the same and the kind of pushes where I shopped more in certain categories kind of came with the seasons. It's sort of a, a thing that happens with me. I tend to shop for clothes more in the winter because I get really interested in all the sweaters. I shop for home goods and decor in the summer when I'm feeling very like motivated. And so I did do some supplemental no buys across the year to kind of help me with places where I felt like it was ramping up. But ultimately, like the only way I like fixed or stopped or avoided doing those sorts of shopping was if I just didn't go into like home goods or wherever. The problem is, is again, Target has all of those sections. While I was pretty good at avoiding like beauty and stationery, wasn't always good at avoiding kitchen shit. It didn't help me overall. I didn't, it didn't give me like an overall lift. The rising tide did not lift all boats when it came to fixing my habits, which was something I was hoping would happen. But on the same note, I don't think it really like amplified my shopping issues with other categories either. It kind of came out in the wash. However, another thing I learned this year, it may not have helped my habits when it came to general shopping, but it did help my habits when it came to shopping for work. Part of the job that I do is making art. Part of the job that I do is making videos and I review things. In the past, I have justified buying anything that even slightly caught my eye when it came to like planners, stationery, and art supplies, because I could say, well, it's for work. You know, I need that for work. One thing I came to like a come to Jesus kind of moment with myself before I started the no buy was that that whole shopping for work thing was allowing me to bring a bunch of shit into the house that I didn't need, that was just gathering dust and it was allowing me sort of a justification for overbuying and over consumerism because I had a reason for it. So setting myself a budget this year really helped me be more thoughtful in terms of what items I bought for work and having the accountability like, oh, I bought this planner to review. I better get it on the channel. There was only one item the whole year and it was this particular paintbrush that I still use. So I'm, I'm fine with it, but it was this one paintbrush that I really wanted. But other than that, I stayed on top of it and it helped me really think about it. Now I will say the one issue with the budget was that it kept me from reviewing as many things as I might have reviewed because I was being so kind of picky and and very, very, very like minimal with what I was bringing in. And so that's something I may want to kind of revisit. But I think my relationship with what I bring into the house for work has gotten a lot better. And the bright side is I don't have hella more shit, another year's worth of shit just collecting dust in my office. I very much recommend this to any of you who might be making YouTube channels and bringing a whole bunch of planners into your life because it's, you know, I have a channel, I'm social media, this is what I do, so I need to have all these things. You really don't. You really don't need to have all these things. Try doing some kind of a no buyer or a budget, it might help you because I hear that excuse a lot from planner influencers. Like, I have all this shit, but I have to buy it because I have a YouTube channel. Do you though? Do you? And I'll also add the other bit from that, the other takeaway from that was that making sure, like giving myself a limit, like if I order X planner to review, it needs to be on my content calendar and reviewed within two months of receiving it. I think that is something really important because in the past I would buy all these planners to review and then some of them I get to them a year later and they weren't even being made anymore. So it was a waste of money. So that's definitely something I'm carrying forward into the new year. This next takeaway, this next thing I learned is pretty obvious, but maybe wasn't for me. The biggest piece of the no buy for me, the most helpful part, of this no buy wasn't actually the no buy. It was the budgeting. Being aware of how much is coming in and how much is going out, especially that how much is going out and keeping on top of that was not something I had ever really done before. And by doing that, it really helped me be honest with myself about what was happening. And you'd think as a 43 year old, almost 44 year old lady that I would have known that already, but apparently I needed this no buy to teach me that. And finally, the last big takeaway from my no buy year and this was not actually something I had anticipated, although I should have knowing myself, the most fun part of the no buy was the empties. So part of my no buy was keeping all of my empties, both my used up beauty products and my like 
used up sticker sheets, used up washi rolls, so that I could account for them at the end of the month when I checked in. That was so satisfying. The beauty stuff maybe got a little less satisfying as the year went on because mo like at the beginning of the year, I was using up a bunch of like travel size things and shit like that. So that was really cool. But by the end of the year, by now, most of my empties are just the same things I'm using over and over. Use up a deodorant, get a new deodorant. Use up a body wash, get the same body wash. Use up a facial cleanser, get the same facial cleanser. Like it's pretty boring when you're basically just using things up and replacing them. But with this, the stickers and the washi and the pens, that was very satisfying. Unfortunately, well maybe not unfortunately, but what wound up happening was that I uh, kind of fell into a highlighter and dot pen and maybe a little washy kind of planning style for the second half of the year. And so I wasn't using anywhere near as many stickers, so I wasn't having as many empties. So that satisfaction kind of dropped off. Recognizing the satisfaction and how motivated I was getting for the satisfaction has made me realize that this next year when I do another no buy, it's gotta have a piece of it tied into using up your shit. Stay tuned for that video, it's coming up very soon. If you really want to like feel satisfied in using your shit, save all of your like empty sticker sheets and then look at them at the end of the month because I will tell you, especially if it's stuff you've already had that you're trying to get rid of, it feels really good. It's like having a glass of Prosecco and looking at Idris Elba. Did I just objectify him? Probably. Anyway, those are the six things that I took away from my no buy year in 2023. Overall, pretty successful. You know, like I said, with planner and stationery and with beauty stuff, I feel like I reset a lot of my habits and I feel like I did a really good job on the no buy. And with the food delivery, we came to a place that feels reasonable and appropriate for our lives. So I, I consider it a success. I would I would love to hear from you in the comments, how did your recent no buy go? If you had a no buy year, if you had a no buy month, if you had a no buy week, let us know how it went in the comments. Stay tuned for my upcoming 2024 no buy video because that will be coming out soon. And in the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your day, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Peace.